Thank you very much. So today I wanted to do something which is a bit um, career oriented. So I'm a scientist. I've been working in international research for the best part of 30 years. And I just wanted to give you some feeling for the journey that got from a student to an international researcher and as an example of the kind of career path that students can follow and along the way illustrate some of the things that I've done and lead up to basically this exciting new uh, big project called the SKA which is hopefully going to revolutionise science and technology in Australia. So um, it's a, a number of points I want to make along the way uh, in this journey, my particular, my personal sort of take on being a scientist and how to be a scientist. I think uh, this always, in particularly in my case, does build upon passions and it builds upon interests that kids get in school. That's where it all starts. That's where it started for me and I talk to a lot of kids and I know that's where it starts for them too. So I'll go and talk about some of these bullets during the talk, building a passion from school, how you choose a university and choose a degree, honours degrees and gap years, uh, PhDs, why would you do one, um, how do you build a global career in science and Last but not least, is there, is there a way back home? A lot of us Australians end up all over the world and a lot of us don't come home, and it's a great thing to be able to come home like I just did recently. So um, those are some of the things I want to talk about during the talk today and try to give some guidance, I guess, for some of the young people that might be involved. So I did grow from a passion in school. I had a great uh, science teacher in about year seven that gave me the passion for science in general, but it took me quite a while to sort of hone down my interest in astronomy. It wasn't until I did uh, physics degree at University of Wollongong and then finally at the end of that physics degree and honours degree in the fourth year uh, where I had exposure to quite a lot of astronomers and so they got me really switched on to science and, and astronomy in particular. And why astronomy? Because um, astronomy is one of those fertile grounds. It's an amazing area to do research because there's so much to be done. It's not like some of the other huge sciences internationally like physics and chemistry and biology where there's thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people working. Um, in astronomy and astrophysics, you've got the whole universe to play with, uh, and there are an enormous number of exciting challenges. Astronomy internationally is not a big subject. You can know all your uh, peers and friends, and so it's a very, very exciting place to do research work. So I decided to do research work in astronomy. I left University of Wollongong after an honours degree in astronomy and went to the Australian National University in Canberra to Mount Stromlo Observatory where I did my PhD thesis. 78 to 82. Mount Stromlo is a beautiful place in the hills outside of uh, Canberra. Unfortunately it was burnt pretty much to the ground in 2003 by an enormous forest fire but uh, there's a few remains left but it was a great place to do research work. And when you choose a place to do research uh, and to become a research scientist you should always choose a place which is world class. I mean there's nothing better for your career than to be taught by the very best people and for those very best people to talk about you and your work when they go overseas to conferences. So being in an excellent, internationally excellent place is absolutely ideal for your career as a researcher. So I went to Mount Stromlo. I, got, I was a bit of a theoretical kind of computational kind of guy from the early days. I wasn't somebody who stuck my eyeball to a telescope and looked through it all night. I was really somebody who loved to play with computers. And so I used that sort of passion in computers and mathematics to understand um, the dynamics, the motions of galaxies, in particular what happens when galaxies come very close together and actually collide. It's a pretty amazing process. And so in the bottom of this little slide here you can see a fairly messed up looking picture of two galaxies which are in the process of collision. And this little movie now is a computer simulation of what happens when two galaxies collide and all these tails and bridges and wisps and filaments are all made during the collisions of galaxies. And so this is the kind of work I did for my thesis work. As I said, thesis and research work is not just about using telescopes, it's about getting out and doing things in mathematics and computers, particularly these days where computers are an important part of doing research. So I did my PhD, it took four years, and then almost uh, the day after I finished I was sort of kicked out and basically said go overseas and get some experience because it's very important in a place like Australia if you're doing an international research career, you do get out and meet the rest of the world. You get out and expose yourself to the vast majority of the researchers who are in fact, of course, overseas. So I went um, from uh, Canberra to California, to Los Angeles in California, where I took up a what's called a postdoctoral position after your doctorate, a three-year position at the California Institute of Technology or Caltech. It's a pretty famous place. Uh, and an incredibly good place to go because, again, the quality of the research stuff there is pretty impressive. So just to underscore how impressive, well, before I get on to the how impressive it is, Caltech is the home of uh, Mount Polymer, the 200-inch telescope. It used to be the world's biggest telescope. Very famous people like Alan 
Sandage and Erwin Hubble all worked at, uh, after the Hubble Space Telescope name, all worked at Caltech. So it's a very famous place for science in general. So just to underscore how uh, impressive the staff is there, it's a traditional when you come as a new staff member at Caltech to uh, give a talk, give a talk about your work. So I was a young postdoc and this was about the second week I was at Caltech, I gave one of these talks. And in the front row of my talk, I remember this probably to the day I die, were sitting the three people in the bottom of this picture, which is a Murray Gell-Mann, Richard Feynman and Willie Fowler, all three of which are Nobel Prize winners. So my audience consisted, I think, of seven Nobel Prize winners, three of which were in the front row. So as a young Australian um, giving his first talk overseas, it was a little bit daunting. But I survived and, and went on and, and really enjoyed my time at Caltech. And it's, again, the quality of the people you work with, the quality of your peers and the quality of the place. It's very important in your career trajectory as you go forward. After I left there, I spent quite a lot of time working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So Los Alamos is a very famous place. It's the place where the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project was. But these days, it's a huge national laboratory in the United States. And it's got an enormous repository of the, some of the world's largest computer systems. So remember, I'm a bit of a computer geek. I love using computers to solve problems. And so you go to where the, the best computers and the biggest computers are. And so here are some of these monster Cray computers and various other things, which were, at the time, and we're talking about now, sort of 20 years ago, were the world's fastest computers. So while these computers weren't doing bad, uh, behind the fence black things, we used to use them to do astronomy in, in front of the fence. And so, so one of the things I got involved with here in this little animation is the actual evolution of the entire universe. So the universe is a big, a dynamical system, uh, galaxies moving around, objects moving around. It's it actually is possible to, so to simulate to evolve enormous pieces of the universe inside of a computer using mathematics. And so this is the kind of research work I was able to do overseas because I was at one of the, the very best places in the world, again, for computers. I was fortunate enough after I left there to go to work for the Hubble Space Telescope Institute. So I worked for NASA. So I worked for NASA for about five years on the Hubble project. So this was before the Hubble project, the Hubble telescope was launched into space. In fact, about two days after I was there, the Challenger disaster occurred and so the whole project was put on delay. But I was there in Baltimore at the University, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And why did I go there? Because again, it was one of the very best places in the world where that time, the Hubble telescope was the biggest and best, best project in the world for optical astronomy. Uh, it, it had enormous promise to solve some fundamental problems in astronomy. And so the entire world were flooding into Baltimore and to the Space Telescope Science Institute and spending time there and doing research there. So again, it was, you were at the crossroads of the world pretty much. And so for a young research person, a great time to actually get involved and see all the researchers, but also to see how big a big project like this really works. NASA built Hubble Space Telescope, about six billion US dollars worth of investment, even in the early 1980s. Um, and so it's again a huge monster science project. And I think it was probably at this point I got interested in these big science projects as well, that as a scientist these days, you have to also understand that as well as doing research, you also have to be a builder and a contributor to the science. You have to be able to participate in the construction development and then operation of some of these very large facilities because they require everybody working together to make them all happen. So I worked at Hubble and, and really enjoyed it. After I left Hubble, I came back to Australia for a short time, went back to Mount Stromlo and joined in a pretty exciting project, which was a joint Australian-American project looking for this mysterious stuff called dark matter. So dark matter is a bit of an embarrassment, okay? We know the universe around us. Um, it's about 100% uh, full of matter, of course, uh, but only about 4% of that matter is actually glowing. It makes glows like stars, it glows in gas and radio. So this 96% of the universe is mysteriously hidden from us, and it's in the form of two things, one called dark matter and one called dark energy. So they're, they're things we have little idea what they are and where they came from. We know they're there because we can sense the effect that this dark matter has on other objects. And so we decided to do an experiment in Australia to actually look for this dark matter, to actually look for signs of this dark objects in the universe that could be this dark matter. So we took an old telescope, a really incredible telescope, this thing called the Great Melbourne Telescope. So this old telescope was built in 1868 in Dublin in Ireland and bought by the Victorian government from proceeds from the gold fields, shipped back to Australia, world's largest telescope sitting in the Melbourne Victor in the Botanical Gardens. 
Um, and it was a photographic telescope right at the very time when basically all the technologies were changing underneath it. So it never became very productive. So it fell into rust and ruin, sat in a garage for about 40 or 50 years, eventually brought up to Mount Stromlo, and we dusted off the dust throughout the cobwebs and the spiders and made it into a modern telescope and did this project with it, which was great. So an old telescope, new release of life. Um, and so we did this thing called the Macho Project, and lo and behold, we did find the first evidence for dark matter in the universe, and that made the front cover of Nature magazine in uh, about 1991. So, you know, these kinds of experiments can be done in astronomy. You can make these major contributions to the field by getting together international groups of people, dedicated research in a particular topic. Again, it was a matter of going to the right place at the right time. That Macho project was one of the very first projects in astronomy where there was a very reasonably large amount of data involved. What we took was images of the sky, digital images of the sky every night, and basically compared them night by night by night and looked for signs of the, this dark matter basically passing in front of and blocking out the light of distant stars. It required, an, for those days, a relatively enormous amount of data, about five gigabytes of data per night, which in those days was an enormous amount. Um, and so that experience in building a project, handling large amounts of data, and getting a good scientific result, um, I got a tap on the shoulder from an organization based in Munich in Germany for me to go to work for them. So they were called the European Southern Observatory. Um, they're the world's largest astronomical organization. They, there are 13 European countries, all put money together and fund the creation of telescopes in Chile. Mostly Chile is where the observing sites for ESO are. So it's a big astronomical research organization. They were thinking at that time, this is about 1995, of building the world's largest telescope called the Very Large Telescope, which is, you know, we're not very good with names, but it's called the Very Large Telescope. Oops, sorry. It's called the Very Large Telescope. And um, it was going to be constructed in Chile. And I was asked to come on board at ESO and help design and build this facility. And in fact, put together the whole sort of science and data system for the telescope. So that began a 12 year adventure uh, and learning lots of new skills. I was a scientist at that point. I was a research scientist. I'd never been involved hands-on way of these, some of these enormous, this is a, a one billion euro project. I'd never been involved. But here was a chance to learn something new. It's a chance to learn how to manage people, manage projects, manage budgets, deliver on time, deliver various things. Skills that you know were probably a little bit foreign to being a scientist and being a researcher. But I'm convinced that these days, to be a good scientist, to be a good researcher, you have to understand those things as well. You cannot possibly succeed in research and science these days without understanding how to design a project, how to run a project, how to manage people and how to manage budgets. That's just part of the way we do science. The old days of the white lab coat and the test tubes, I think it's pretty much gone for many subjects and I think for astronomy is one of them. So I went to ESO in 1995 and started to work on the construction of the Very Large Telescope. Um, this telescope was actually, here it is, finished. It was finished in um, 2001, was the first light of all four telescopes. There's four big telescopes. Each telescope has a big mirror in it. Those mirrors are eight meters across, so huge mirrors. Each one of those mirrors costs about 20 million euros. Every telescope's about 450 tons of optics and steel moving around. And it's an incredible machine for doing science. It's four individual telescopes on a mountaintop in Chile in the, in the high Atacama Desert but they can be combined together and also form impressive pictures as in a combined sort of way. So this is one of the pictures that was formed when the telescopes were combined together. This is actually a movie that was made of the motions of stars in the middle of our own Milky Way galaxy. So over a course of many, many years, this telescope had such an incredible accuracy of images that you could actually follow the motions of stars around the center of the galaxy. Now, the interesting thing, that star that's just gone around the center of the galaxy, there's nothing there where it went around, okay? This, this star is going around something, but the something isn't there. And so this is the first evidence that was collected for the existence of a black hole. So we believe there's a black hole in the middle of our own Milky Way galaxy, weighs about a million times the mass of our sun, and here's probably the, some of the best evidence we have of the existence of this rather amazing object. And with, that is possible because we spent a billion euros because 600 people lived on a mountaintop for four or five years and constructed this amazing machine for doing science. So great science comes from great machines and great machines require lots and lots of work. People from all over the world working together. If you're going to be a researcher, you have to understand this and you have to be able to participate in international science. 
2006, I decided it was probably time to come back to Australia. I'd been away for about 25 years, and finding a, finding a way back is part of the story. Um, Australia doesn't have high mountains, it doesn't have the Andes, it doesn't have these sorts of things, so there's not the opportunity in Australia to um, build big telescopes, build big observatories, and hence Australia uses other people's stuff pretty much all the time. And it was absolutely amazing to me that in 2006, I discovered that there was a real chance of probably the world's biggest astronomical facility actually coming to Australia. So there was a chance, indeed, that this thing called the Square Kilometre Array would come to Western Australia. And so I packed my bags and my family and headed to Western Australia and was lucky enough to get a position at the University of Western Australia as a Premier's Fellow uh, to begin building up a brand new research group in Western Australia in anticipation of this project coming, but also to help Australia win this project because at the moment we are in a race. There are, there are two places in the world where we could put this telescope, one in the western part of Western Australia, the other in Southern Africa. Both those groups of people are competing at the moment very, very hard on the international stage to win the location of this project. We hope to basically have that decision in about the beginning of next year, about the beginning of 2012. The SKA is an amazing machine. I won't say very much about it, but basically this is a history of the universe. The top of the diagram is the Big Bang. The bottom of the diagram is today. There's a big piece in the middle here, which is the unknown. It's where we, d we have never been with a telescope before. Okay? The SKA is designed to penetrate the unknown. It's designed to penetrate right back into that particular part of the history of the universe. And so it's a machine which is 10,000 time, 10, times more comparable, capable than machines we have today, 10,000 times, which is a pretty impressive figure. This is an impression, a video, of what that telescope might look like. It's not one big telescope, a kilometre by a kilometre. It's 3,000 individual radio dishes spread out over 3,000 kilometres. So it's a machine for doing science, which is 3,000 kilometres across. The radio signals from the universe get into these dishes. They're connected together by fibre optics and produce the data we need to probe the distant universe. As I said, 10,000 times more capable than anything we have today. In the past, every time we've built a telescope, it's going to be about five times better than its predecessor. This telescope's 10,000 times better than its predecessors, and so that's impressive. So the square kilometre array, it's not square, it's not a kilometre of metal, but it's these amazing dishes spread out in the desert, and hopefully the desert of Western Australia. It's also probably the world's biggest ICT project as well and involves some incredible computers. That's why my passion for computers comes back into this. The world's largest computer is going to be the computer we need to run this particular telescope. We put it in Western Australia because it's very radio quiet. And this is a very sensitive radio to receiver and so we don't want people around. We don't want people make radio noise and so we don't want them around. And so hopefully in 2020, this is what the desert of Western Australia is going to look like. It's going to be the home to the world's largest scientific facility. I talked before about always choosing strength. This is a little plot that shows how strong Australia is in some of the key science areas. This is ecology and the environment, geosciences, immunology and astronomy and space sciences. These are some of the key scientific strengths of Australia. You can see in astronomy and space science, Australia actually outperforms the United States, the European Union and China in terms of the impact of the papers we produce. We are a very strong research community in astronomy and because of the SKA, we're going to become stronger. So, just going back to the endpoints here. I had a passion in school. I had a great teacher who taught me stuff. That passion stayed with me all my life and I'm sure that's true today as it was 30 years ago. Um, choose the best university you can. Choose a place which has excellent people because through excellent people, you become excellent. Honours degrees, I think an honours degree and a once you go to an honours degree, the fourth year of your undergraduate and a PhD, these are commitments to a career in research. I don't like gap years, so if you like gap years, I don't like gap years. Uh, PhDs, why? PhD is a big commitment. It's very easy to float out of an honours degree into a PhD. Um, it's a huge part of your life. It's four years when you're early 20s. Um, you've got to be prepared for it mentally and physically, um, so don't take it lightly if you choose that particular career path. Build a global career. Don't be afraid to travel. Don't be afraid to take risks learn new skills because astronomy is a global science. Don't sit on your bottom at home. Uh, go and learn new things, learn new skills because they're all part of being a scientist. And finally, ways back home. We've got a fantastic way back home now. If we can win this SKA project, uh, Australia will be box seat, front and centre, one of the world's great research nations. 
Great, thank you very much for that, Peter. We do have some questions coming in now, so I'll put those to you. So one of the first questions we've had is, what do you believe will be the future of space-based telescopes, such as Hubble that you were talking about, now that the NASA shuttle fleet are about to be retired? Yeah, I think there is a future in the sense that there is a, now a new telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the successor to Hubble. It'll be launched in about three or four years' time, but it'll be a completely hands-off telescope. It'll be a telescope which is launched up into a very much, much higher orbit than Hubble was. It's not meant to be serviced. It's not meant to be touched. Once it's out there, it's out there. It's free-flying. It's autonomous. And I think that's the way telescopes in space are going to go. We cannot afford to go up there and service them all the time. Um, we have a question from Shane. What is the best guess for what dark matter actually is? So the Matra project we did was looking for dark matter, which was big, chunky stuff like rocks and you know pieces of moons and you know things that which were big, right? We didn't find that stuff. If it, if it was there, we would have found it if it was in that form. The best guess for dark matter these days is subatomic level material, subatomic particles, basically subatomic particles that were created in the Big Bang. So the only way you're going to find them is with a particle physics detector. In fact, the Large Hadron, large Hadron Collide, <coughs> excuse me, in Geneva might in fact give us some insights into dark matter. Um, I had a question actually. W when you showed that slide about uh, your experiment looking at dark matter <coughs> and the star going around the black hole, right. did the star ever disappear into the black hole? Is no. that something <laughs> we've ever seen? Um, we, we see it indirectly. So that star's in a stable orbit. So basically that star basically can go around and around, around as long as it likes. Um, we have seen some cases where, dark, where black holes, where we know there's a black hole, we're seeing flashes, flashes of, of light. And we think those flashes of light actually occur when stars actually drop into the black hole, right? So we've seen indirect evidence of this. Uh, we have another question here from Phil. Is it correct that the SETI project has lost funding? And what are your thoughts on this? Um, the SETI project has not lost funding. What happened was that there's a telescope that SETI was using called the Allen Telescope Array. That telescope has lost funding, and so that's not available to SETI anymore. But SETI uses telescopes all over the world to do search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and so the project continues. It's just that that was its, probably its best telescope, but they haven't got access to that anymore. They'll probably look for access to other telescopes, and in fact, SETI has been one of the very most, uh, very active founding members of the SKA consortium, and the SKA is probably the best SETI telescope ever designed. Um, another question here, your comment on the PhD that if you're doing one then you should be focused on research, however there are not enough research jobs for the numbers doing PhDs, would you like to comment on this? Sure, I think, I think people maybe in the past have floated out, as I said, into PhDs without thinking too much about it and the system has absorbed them quite rapidly. I think people are a little bit more, they need to be more circumspect, I think Research career is a very demanding career. There isn't very many jobs. We know that, particularly in subject like astronomy. So you've got to be, uh, I think the people who are offering PhDs need to think about that. I think the people who are taking on PhDs need to think about that. I do think, I agree, I think there's probably been a few too many go into the system. But having said that, projects like SKA are going to gobble up PhDs at a great rate. So there is a bright future. Um. Are there boundaries to the size of the universe? And if so, how can that be? If I had a Just dollar, a dollar, simple for, question. a dollar for every time that question comes up. <laughs> um, look, the universe, it's hard to describe it in terms of a physical analogy, right? A lot of people describe the universe like a beach ball. So there's a beach ball, it's round, it has a surface, and so if you're on the ant on the beach ball, you can wander any way you like, you never find an edge, but the beach ball is finite in size. And the universe has some of those attributes. It doesn't look like a beach ball, of course, but the universe has some attributes which are the same. It doesn't have physical boundaries that we think of like a beach ball doesn't have physical boundaries, but there's an horizon in the universe. There's a place in the universe where we can't see beyond. It's basically because light in the, it's the universe is, the universe is a particular age. It's about 13.7 billion years. And so light travels a certain distance in 13.7 billion years. And so anything that happened to be further away than 13.7 billion light years, we would never see it. So there's an horizon in the universe. So the boundaries and the, the places where you can and cannot see in the universe tend to be set by the speed of light. That's the, really the biggest limiter, if you like, for the universe. Um, we have another question here. Will the SKA see different wavelengths of light usually seen by current radio telescopes? 
Um, SKA is a radio telescope, so it does see radio waves, but it sees a very broad spectrum of radio waves, all the way from what we would call the FM bands, down around about 100 megahertz, like your favourite FM stations, all the way up into the tens of gigahertz. So there's a very big range from, so from FM frequencies to mobile phone frequencies to television frequencies and all the way up. So it's a very, very broad uh, range of frequencies because it actually uses different technologies for those different frequencies. It's not just, you saw a lot of dishes today, there's also other kinds of receivers which receive very low frequencies as well. Um, I have a question here about the skills that you talked about that scientists need in terms of project management and people management and communication mm -hmm. skills. Sure. Um, are they, they skills that you think are being covered in science degrees or is that something that uh, how can that be addressed, that, sure. that skill no, I think I think that's a very good question. I think, in, in my opinion, the answer is no. These are not being covered. And in fact, in Western Australia, University of Western Australia, at ICRA, we're trying to do exactly this, to incorporate into our undergraduate program some of these courses, so Project Management 101, right? We have to, people have to understand how projects work, what the vocabulary is, if nothing else, work breakdown structures and deliverables and Gantt charts and all these sort of things. They are part of the language of doing science. And so we have to teach our young researchers, we have to teach our undergraduates how to at least understand these concepts because they're not gonna get them you know, at the end of the day. So yes, I completely agree with the question that we should have in our basic training, basic boot, you know, toolkit for our young researchers, some of these skills. Um, another question here, when and how is it decided whether Australia will be home for the SKA? So there is an international body, an international board for the SKA. So the SKA is an international effort. So there are, at the moment, there are 10 countries who have formed this international board that has basically the money to run the project, if you like. That board um, will be the board which decides upon the decision, not decides, but the location of the SKA early in 2012, about February of 2012. So right now, what's happening is that there's an international process running where the two nations are submitting to that board all the data that describes their site and all the things that the, the fiber optics and the power and the cost of labor and all the other things that you would need to know if you were gonna choose a place to build the SKA. So Australia and New Zealand who are collaborating and the Southern African countries who are collaborating are both submitting these uh, documents to this international process. They'll go in in September this year. There's then a long adjudication process and hopefully in February, early in February next year, we'll have a decision by this international council, if you like, of the SKA. Excellent. Does anyone else have any further questions online there? Here we go. Has the technology of optical telescopes reached an end of life and radio telescopes are the future? No, in fact it's interesting at the, at the very same time as we're thinking about the SKA, the world is also thinking about the next generation of optical telescopes. So the telescopes you saw, the VLT, they're probably the last of their kind because the mirrors, the, uh, the big mirror that's in the VLT is a single monolithic piece of optics. That's about as big as you can build single monolithic pieces of optics because of the physical strength, if you like, of the material. If you're going to go to a bigger telescope, you have to actually build a segmented mirror. So the mirror is made of like segments, like little hexagons, and they're all cemented together to make a big structure. So the world's now thinking about building a telescope based upon this segmented mirror technology that's going to be 42 meters in diameter. It's called the European Extremely Large Telescope, <laughs> not VLT, but ELT. Uh, it's going to be built again in Chile. That project is in the final phases of decision or funding. Uh, again, this is a, a billion euro project and hopefully starts construction in 2015. But that's the future of optical astronomy is also going forward as well. Um, why are New Zealand collaborating? What's in it for them? Well, one of the interesting things about radio telescopes is the bigger they are, the better they are. So if you've got dishes spread on the ground, the further you spread those dishes apart, the higher the accuracy, the higher the resolution of the radio images that you can make. So if we put dishes in Australia, which is 3,000 kilometres across, we get a certain resolution. If we put a few dishes in New Zealand, we get a 5,500 kilometre baseline. That's considerably better resolution. And so putting some array stations in New Zealand is an incredibly good advantage for the SKA. So the New Zealanders are very keen to participate. Excellent.
Well, I think we may have covered all of the questions that have come online. If anyone has any further questions online, please post them now. Um, Peter, was there any other points that you wanted to touch on today? No, I think as I said, it's an exciting, it's an incredibly exciting time for uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, at this time of decision of the SKA. We're looking at, a, as I said, a game changer in terms of our science and technology futures in this country, in terms of opportunities as well. Remember I said the SKA is an incredible ICT, Information Communications Technology Project, the world's largest computer system. This telescope produces the same amount of data in a day, one day, that the whole planet produces in a year. So you can imagine what a challenge this is to computer technology around the world. And so the careers are not just in astronomy, the careers are in computer science, algorithms, hardware, information systems, data transport, fiber optics. So it's not just astronomy. Actually, one final question. How many people do you think might end up with jobs on the SKA project from anything from being a researcher involved to someone who's helping build the, build the telescope array? The construction of a project like this will probably take several hundred people, maybe five or six hundred people would be involved just in the building of it. The operation of the telescope is probably two or three hundred people internationally, spread out in various locations. The international research community that's going to use it is probably about 10,000 scientists, right? So, you know, this is the sort of scale of the numbers we're talking about. Excellent. Okay, well, I think that's all of the questions that have come through online. I'd like to thank everyone online who's watched and taken part today. And Peter, I'd like to thank you very much for taking part in our RIOS PD Plus session today. My pleasure. Thank you.